Good morning and welcome to our case of the week for December 14th, 2021. Thanks so much for joining me today. My name is Kelly Twigger. I am the CEO and founder of eDiscovery Assistant and the principal at ESI Attorneys. So happy to be here with you today. And uh, thanks for taking a few minutes out of your day to join us and, and hear about this week's decision. This is our second to last broadcast for 2021. It's hard to believe how quickly this year has gone um, and how much I still miss seeing all of you. Hopefully 2022 will clear up things a little bit in the world and we'll be able to get together a little bit more. Um, that's my hope. As always, we would encourage you to please reach out to us with any issues or questions that you're having in eDiscovery so we can cover those on Case of the Week and be able to provide some practical solutions. You can reach out to us, to me directly at kelly at eDiscoveryAssistant.com or to our team at support at eDiscoveryAssistant.com. We'd love to hear from you. Um, as always, the link to the decision today, uh, which is viewable on eDiscovery Assistant, is in the comment section of whatever platform you're viewing us on, whether that's LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, I almost forgot that last one. Um, I also have posted today, or I should say Deja, my uh, super great partner in crime here, has posted a link to an article from my very good friend, David Horrigan, who is eDiscovery Council at Relativity, um, that David also wrote on this decision. And I believe that David's article was published um, also on law.com, in addition to being on the Relativity blog, but you can view it for free at the link that is in the comment section. Uh, you can also jump to our website at eDiscoveryAssistant.com if you're interested in signing up for a demo. We now offer demos uh, each week on Thursday morning. Uh, you can also sign up for a personalized demo at another time if that suits you better. Uh, so just hop on over there and uh, use the links at the top right corner to sign up. You can also uh, download our 2020 uh, eDiscovery case law report from eDiscovery Assistant that we publish in cooperation with uh, Doug Austin at eDiscovery Today, and we're working on our 2021 report. So um, that should be available hopefully by the end of January, beginning of February at Legal Week. And speaking of Legal Week, if you'll be there, please let us know so that we can uh, connect and say hi. All right, all that aside, let us get into this week's decision. This week's uh, decision is in a case called Heslin v. Jones. And uh, sad as it is to report, uh, these this is one of a series of decisions that was brought by parents of children who were killed uh, in the Sandy Hook mass shooting in Connecticut. And they were brought against um, Alex Jones, uh, his company Infowars, or his company is called Free Speech System, which owns Infowars, as well as um, Alex Jones' partner um, on the host of The War Room, Owen Schroyer, um, for essentially alleging that the uh, shooting was a mass hoax um, that was perpetrated uh, in or by Second Amendment opponents. So basically people who were opposed to guns uh, basically created this notion that there was a shooting of small children um, in Sandy Hook, which as we know is completely uh, wrong and uh, a horrible thing to happen to these parents of these children who were massacred. Those are the underlying facts of the case. What's before the court, as always, is a discovery uh, dispute. Um, and this case is before the court on a motion for sanctions. And here the court really goes through and recounts what can only be described as an enormously serious history of discovery abuses, both in this particular decision that was pending in Texas, a state court, as well as multiple other cases pending in Texas and in Connecticut that were brought by parents um, of children from the Sandy Hook shooting against these same defendants. And in essence, the court lays out a series of dispute, a series of uh, discovery abuses, a failure to comply uh, with an October 18th, uh, 2019 discovery order, a failure to supplement uh, discovery as promised by the defendants in 2019, um, another failure to supplement discovery in June of 2019, repeatedly violating discovery orders in multiple cases, not just this case. As I mentioned, the, the court really looked at all of the other cases that are both in Texas and Connecticut and found that the defendants had engaged in, quote, pervasive and persistent obstruction of the discovery process in general, close quote. And the court found that that showed, quote, a deliberate, contumacious, and unwarranted disregard for the court's authority, close quote. 
In making those findings, the court granted a default judgment for the families uh, for what she said were continual and egregious discovery violations. And that's really key here, right? We talk a lot about how difficult it is to get terminating sanctions in federal court. And so that's really the key takeaway from this case that we want to talk about. So we'll come back to that. Um, here, the part of, the court really said that, that, quote, the defendant's discovery conduct in this case has shown flagrant bad faith and callous disregard for the responsibilities of discovery under the rules. The court finds the defendant's conduct is greatly aggravated by the consistent pattern of discovery abuse throughout the other Sandy Hook cases pending before this court, close quote. Now, the court did also consider whether or not lesser sanctions were going to be appropriate here, um, and they acknowledged that with a default judgment, they were essentially precluding the defendants from presenting their case on the merits, but the court found that they would have uh, be, the lesser sanctions would be inadequate given the defendant's uh, discovery abuses in this case and other cases. And there's a key quote uh, from the court that I think is really important as you're considering analysis for terminating sanctions going forward. And it reads like this. However, the court has a more than sufficient record to conclude that an escalating series of judicial admonishments, monetary penalties, and non-dispositive sanctions have all been ineffective at deterring the abuse. This court rejects lesser sanctions because they have proven ineffective when previously ordered. They would also benefit defendants and increase the cost to plaintiffs, and they would not adequately serve to correct defendants' persistent discovery abuses. Furthermore, in considering whether lesser remedies would be a bit effective, this court has also considered defendants' general bad faith approach to litigation, Mr. Jones' public threats, and Mr. Jones' professed belief that these proceedings are, quote, show trials, close quote, end quote. That language is really important for a number of reasons. Um, it, it shows that the court is not only considering what's happening in the litigation, but what's happening outside of the litigation. You heard a lot about gag orders that have been placed on defendants or witnesses in the past. And um, while there was not one here, essentially the court saying, hey, you, you're going out and you're espousing this on your radio show and on television. And we can't have that. That's not appropriate. And in addition to the fact that you've not engaged in discovery effectively in any of these cases, a default judgment is appropriate. So the, there's a lot of analysis in that quote uh, to be broken down as to how the court rejects lesser sanctions that you'll want to be able to use if you've got similar uh, levels of discovery abuse. And so, you know, that's part of the takeaway from this case. What are the additionals? Now, some of you are going to look at this case, and, and I've had this in the past with clients and say, well, we would never engage in that level of discovery abuse such that we would be before the court on terminating sanctions. And that's very likely uh, to be true, but there are some really key takeaways from this case uh, that help you in terms of being able to move for sanctions or being able to fight sanctions. And, and that is that your conduct in other cases will matter. So when you're taking positions, when you're making arguments in other cases, you got to remember those are public decisions and those may be things that the court takes into account. Now, each case is different and each case should be tried on its own individual merits. Um, discovery and how discovery is handled in an individual case is going to come first. But when those discovery abuses in that case exist, the court's going to look to other, the other factors, what you're saying to the public, what you've done in other cases. And that's really important to consider here because you want to know for your client when you're making decisions that the decision that you make today is going to impact other cases down the road, potentially. Um, in this case, um, you know, it's a little bit different because all these Sandy Hook cases were related. But the judge saw that pattern, not just in the case before her, but across multiple cases uh, brought by parents of children that were killed at Sandy Hook. Now, let's talk about the difference between Texas law and the federal rules of civil procedure when it comes to the imposition of terminating sanctions. And in this case, that's a default judgment. Texas law does not have the same intent standard that's required under Rule 37E. Uh, for issuing terminating sanctions. So the court really does no analysis of intent. And the question becomes, would that really be different under Rule 37? And I, I want to be clear, this is also an issue that David covered in his article, uh, and it's a really crucial one. This case involved a violation of multiple court orders and, and likely would fall under Rule 37B2 as opposed to Rule 37E. 
uh, because 37B2 provides sanctions for disobeying a court order. And that section specifically provides that a court can enter a default judgment uh, without the intent that's required under Rule 37E for failure to preserve. So Rule 37B is for violation of a, a discovery order. Rule 37E is for violations for failure to preserve. Right. So the intent standard in, under the federal rules is on the failure to preserve that you've got to show that intent. So what does that mean? It means that one, you need to know what your jurisdiction's rules are on what you can get for sanctions and when you're going to have to prove that level of intent. You, again, need to understand the different sections of sanctions rules that are available and you should not be afraid to move to compel. I see a lot of uh, lawyers who are, you know, don't want to rock the boat, don't want to file motions to compel. But the result is that you get an order. If you're successful, if your motion to compel is valid, you get an order from the court. And when that order is violated, you've got a better step towards leaning on uh, Rule 37B2 or the state equivalent, which doesn't require intent for terminating sanctions. So we've seen some cases on our case of the week where terminating sanctions seemed like they should be uh, awarded, but we were under Rule 37E and we've got that high intent uh, standard that has to be met. So know what your standards are. Don't be afraid to move to compel. Don't make spurless motions. I am not advocating for you making frivolous or spurless motions that don't have merit. But where you've met and conferred and where you're not getting the discovery that you should be getting, you need to move to compel so that you have that discovery order as a basis for your motion for sanctions later. It's just going to be an easier analysis to be able to get to terminating sanctions or even something more effective. Because frankly, the court has said, you need to do this. And if you don't do it, then the court is going to be upset. It's just an easier uh, analysis on sanctions. So don't be afraid to make those motions. Okay, it's a quick one, but that's our important case of the week for this week. Thanks so much for joining me. If you are an ACEDS member and interested in using eDiscovery Assistant, there's a discount available to current ACEDS members and a trial for folks taking the ACEDS exam. If you're interested in either of those, please just drop our team a line at ACEDS at eDiscoveryAssistant.com. Similarly, if you are not an ACEDS member but are interested in using the platform, you can reach out to us at support at eDiscoveryAssistant.com or you can pop to the website and sign up for a trial in the upper right hand corner. All right. Thanks so much. Have a great, uh, great rest of your week and happy holidays. See you next week.